Boa noite a todos, guten Abend, herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu der äh, zweiten Veranstaltung der Reihe Lecture in Film, äh, Tropical Underground, das brasilianische Cinema Marginal und de, die Revolution des Kinos. Ähm, ich freue mich sehr, ähm, alle hier begrüßen zu dürfen zu dieser Reihe. Das ist natürlich sehr speziell, dass ähm, die Reihe Lecture in Ki und Film äh, haben wir es schon seit Jahren hier im Kino des Filmmuseums, aber dies ist besonders, ähm, ja, Speziell, denn wir nicht äh, nur äh, ein äh, Regisseur oder Regisseurin hier äh, untersuchen werden im Laufe dieser Reihe, wie wir schon mit Pasolini oder Varda oder Godard schon gemacht haben, sondern eine gesamte Bewegung, wie man das äh, so nennen kann, äh, des Kinos hier präsentieren wollen. Und äh, wir freuen uns sehr auf die Gäste und die Filme, die wir äh, hier im in, in Laufe dieser Reihe zeigen dürfen. Und, äh, wir freuen uns besonders also heute Abend auf der äh, Lecture von äh, Stefan Solomon, äh, der gleich hier sprechen wird. Und ähm, wir werden auch äh, gleich äh, ins Englisch äh, wechseln. Ich wollte nur ganz kurz ein paar Wörter hier sagen. Ähm, falls äh, Sie das noch nicht gesehen haben, wir haben das gesamte Programm in diese wunderschöne ähm, Club äh, Flyer, der auch ein Plakat ist. Aber Sie können dann alle Informationen, weil diese Reihe geht bis ähm, Juli 2018, so es gibt genug Gelegenheit für andere ähm, Veranstaltungen auch und wir freuen uns sehr, wenn Sie ähm, wieder bei uns kommen und auch zu den anderen Veranstaltungen dieses äh, diese Veranstaltungen diese Reihe oder wie sagt man, diese ähm, Campusveranstaltung, wie das äh, genannt wird, Tropical Underground, das nicht nur hier im Kino des Filmmuseums stattfindet, aber ähm, das können Sie auch mehr äh, erfahren in dieser Broschüre. Und äh, wir freuen uns besonders äh, auf heute Abend und äh, ich äh, freue mich, dass äh, Professor Vincent Rediger bei uns hier ist und wird dann unsere heutige Gast ähm, vorstellen. Vielen Dank. Äh, wir machen das äh, wie immer dann äh, zuerst die Lecture, äh, dann gibt es eine kleine Pause und dann geht es weiter mit dem Film. Ähm, das ist ähm, immer so hier bei den Lectures, die dich schon kennen, aber wenn ihr das noch nicht kennt, erkläre ich das äh, gern. Und dass wir nach dem Film noch ein Gespräch haben, dann hätten sie auch die Gelegenheit, Fragen zu stellen. Dann, Professor Hediger, bitte. Ja. Danke für die Einführung und guten Abend auch von mir. And I'm going to switch to English uh, so as to introduce um, our guest. Um, this series, as uh, Laura just mentioned, is different from the ones that we've tried or that we've organized before because we're not focusing on one particular director, but we're focusing on a movement in a specific historical situation in a specific country. Um, and we do that because we believe it's, it's a highly significant moment and a highly significant movement, one that helps us understand the logic, uh, the cultural logic of globalization, if you will, in a particularly uh, instructive uh, uh, way. And we also think that these films deserve to be more widely known and discovered. Um, there are there, you know, the, the, the cinema marginal is called marginal for a reason. Um, it's a uh, um, marginal, self-defined marginal uh, aesthetic and artistic movement, but it uh, is one, you know, if you take seriously Jacques Derrida's uh, approach to philosophy, which has influenced a lot of people in literary studies as well, and in philosophy, then the interesting things always happen at the margins. Uh, and it's from the margins that you uh, have to recalibrate the center and that you have to understand what it is really going on. So our choice of, of focusing on a, on a self-declared cinema marginal at what seems to be a marginal moment in cultural history is actually motivated by precisely uh, such an, such an uh, interest in uh, rethinking the uh, hierarchy of center and periphery Uh, from uh, what will turn out to be actually not really the margins. Um, when we uh, put out, this is a, a bit of self-congratulation that you're going to have endure now. Uh, when we first put out the program in the usual 
social network forums on Facebook, somebody who knows quite a great deal about Brazilian cinema commented on our lecture and film program, well, they have all the essential films and they have the best speakers. Um, and I thought, yeah, that's right. We uh, <laughs> redid our homework. And uh, that certainly uh, also goes for tonight's speaker, uh, Stefan Solomon, who comes to us from the University of Reading, where he is currently a postdoc researcher in a large-scale um, uh, interdisciplinary project on Brazilian cinema um, called Towards a Intermedial History of Brazilian Cinema, Exploring uh, Intermediality as a Historiographic Method. And... Um, Stefan's a particular focus in that project is on the uh, Tropicalia movement and its um, consequences and reverberations in Brazilian cinema. Uh, Tropicalia, as you may remember from our first lecture in the series, is the title of, a, of an art installation by Elio Chisica, which became the label for a popular music movement moment in 1968 and then became sort of the frame of reference for Brazilian counterculture in in the 1960s. And uh, Stefan is a true specialist for what we're trying to do here because his current work uh, really deals uh, with that particular moment in Brazilian history. Um, uh, Stefan Solomon comes to us from Reading, or we could say he comes to us via Reading from Australia because uh, he's uh, originally from Australia. He's a dual citizen, though, as I learned tonight over the dinner. So he's a European as well, even though some Brits don't think they're European or don't want to be anymore, but they are. Um, so he's a Aussie and a European, and he earned his doctorate um, from the University of New South Wales uh, with a, a dissertation that has since been come out as a book with the University of Georgia Press. It has been published in August 2017, and this is a truly fascinating work. Um, it's on William Faulkner's Hollywood career, and it's called William Faulkner in Hollywood Screenwriting in the Studio uh, for the studios, sorry, screenwriting for the studios. So uh, in addition to being a specialist on Brazilian cinema, Stefan Solomon is also a specialist on um, uh, screenwriting, on the screenwriting process in uh, the classical Hollywood system. And he's also a curator. Uh, he is currently curating a film series which is part of the project um, uh, that uh, he's conducting together and actually under the supervision of Luciana Gip, who will be speaking here in um, February uh, at the University of Reading. And he's currently curating a film program entitled Beyond Tropicalia um, uh, at the Tate Modern. Um, and I think that's actually going to happen next week. And also next week, or actually today, is the date of publication of the book related to that film series, which is a big book with 22 essays and a lot of historical materials and photographs, uh, which we will hope to, which we hope to have ready for you to purchase in the bookstore upstairs uh, at the next event of our Tropical Underground series. It's published by a Berlin publisher, so it should be easy to get here. Um, uh, and uh, we're, we will make sure that you uh, you will be able to lay your hands on that book in the Frankfurt Film Museum bookstore. So without further ado, um, I hand over the microphone to Stefan. I'm really glad you could make it here. And uh, we're very much looking forward to learning about what exactly Derir is. Well, uh, thank you, Vincennes, for that uh, very kind, too kind introduction uh, and for the invitation to, to be here speaking as part of the Tropical Underground series. Um, thank you also to Paola, uh, one of the curators of this series, and to uh, Laura especially uh, for managing to get hold of this film, which, um, as I've discovered, um, as I'm curating the series for the Tate, isn't always the easiest of things to do. So thank you for your efforts, efforts there. Um, Vincent has already mentioned the project to which I'm attached, um, but by way of introduction I'll just say a little bit about that and you can find out more for yourself if you go to the website there. But 
well, I've been working for two years now on this project, uh, which is a, another way of examining the history of Brazilian cinema. Um, I'm working with colleagues at my university, the University of Reading, but also colleagues in uh, Brazil at the University of San Carlos, uh, where we're doing collaborative work um, through a series of conferences, edited collections, um, and uh, events like the, the, the series at the Tate Modern that I'm curating. Um, and we're also restaging these uh, theatrical prologues that took place in Brazil in the 1920s um, as a precursor to films. And we're restaging those next year, both in uh, Brazil and Sao Paulo and in Reading as well. So we have a number of different uh, aspects of that project. Um, but before all else, our focus is on uh, intermediality, on this term, um, the idea that, um, in the words of Agnes Petter, um, that cinema can, quote, incorporate forms of all other media and can in initiate fusions and dialogues between the arts. So we're looking at Brazilian cinema particularly as a case study in terms of intermediality, but this is a way um, that we can think about cinema more generally. Um, we're looking in terms of the Brazilian context at uh, silent cinema through to the chanchadas, the musical comedies of the 30s through to the 60s, and all the way up to overlaps between digital technologies and cinema today. And uh, my particular contribution to the project, as Vincent's mentioned, is, uh, is to do with Tropicalia, um, both in terms of its uh, initial moment in the, in the late 60s, but also through um, to the 70s and on to today, um, and it, the way that it resonated in Cinema Marginal and other contexts. So in considering uh, what, I, what I wanted to say about this film tonight, about Ivan Cardoso's um, O Segredo do Mumia, The Secret of the Mummy, um, I was thinking in terms of intermediality, in terms of the various connections that this film has with other art forms, um, with particularly um, the plastic arts, with concrete poetry uh, and with comic books. So there are a number of different connections uh, to this film. But when I saw the film for the first time, um, I was struck, as you might be, um, by how simplistic it appears to be um, as a genre film, it, because it is a genre film first and foremost. Um, and it seems to take itself not too seriously as something that's quite humorous, um, bawdy, and it plays into a myth, um, the myth of the mummy, which has been uh, trotted out countless times in the history of cinema. Um, and it always has, uh, that, that story of the mummy always has a kind of whiff of the ridiculousness, uh, of the ridiculous about it. But on the other hand, I think, um, and as I hope to show in my in my lecture, that this is a film that does want to be taken seriously in some respects. And Ivan Cardoso, um, even as a genre filmmaker, does want to be taken seriously in his work in in genre, but also his work in uh, in the more kind of radical experimental sphere uh, and the overlaps that he that he kind of shows throughout his career between um, experimental and genre filmmaking. Perhaps um, this kind of observation about genre filmmakers is self-evident. All genre filmmakers or a lot of genre filmmakers do want to be taken seriously as genre filmmakers, um, even if their films don't appear to be serious. Um, but I don't, And I don't think that The Secret of the Mummy requires any special pleading from me or from anyone else to be enjoyed as a genre film, as a, as a film about um, a mummy. Um, and it certainly is worthy of, uh, of, of the horror comedy or, or, or even just comedy status that it holds. Um, but on the other hand, and especially in the context of this series, I thought that it would be interesting to think about it in terms of um, both the Cinema Marginal movement, in terms of Tropicalia, which I'll allude to but might discuss later in question time, and also to other art forms which are perhaps taken more seriously. So as my title suggests, uh, Ivan Cardoso uh, was the self-proclaimed Mestre do Terir, the master of Terir, um, a genre that he he uh, he invented essentially, which combines uh, terror and rir um, to laugh. Um, so essentially, a, a version of horror comedy. And he modeled himself after um, Hitchcock. Hitchcock is the master of suspense. So Cardoso is the ma uh, Mestre do Terir. Um, so there is this, this this kind of obvious, I mean, interesting self-fashioning going on, but also quite um, obvious comedy, comic element to his work. Um, but the, the elements of the work that I want to look at tonight are, are more avant-garde, as I've said, and there are things that tend to disappear when we watch the film. They're not visible at all. They don't present themselves to us. So elements of the plastic arts and elements of uh, concrete poetry, which are completely absent from the film. 
one of the um, one of the ways that this that this takes place, one of the ways that Cardoso uh, absorb, absorbed different influences throughout his career and, and into this film, um, is because of the fact that this film was essentially uh, produced over an entire decade. So, uh, although the film was released in 1982 uh, as The Secret of the Mummy, uh, it also began um, as uh, A Mumia Volta a Takar uh, in 1972 as a Super 8 film, The Mummy Attacks Again. Uh, and then it was revisited by Cardoso in 1977, um, titled Olago, Olago, Olago Maldito, The Cursed Lake. Um, before he finally uh, worked it into a feature film. So Cardoso made two attempts, essentially, at working this mummy film into something finished. Um, neither of the two first attempts were finished, but in 82, um, it finally came out as a feature film. So there's this really fascinating production history that I want to talk about tonight um, to see how a Super 8 short could become something um, full-length and Cardoso's first feature-length film. So The Secret of the Mummy is most obviously, I think, um, a film that depends on a long history of other mummy films. It finds its place in a lineage of uh, mummy films that begins in the silent era, but most obviously uh, for Cardoso derives from Carl Freund's 1932 film The Mummy for the Universal Horror Cycle. Um, but it also depends quite concretely on the four mummy films produced for RKO, um, three of which starred uh, Lon Chaney, and which I'll refer to shortly. Um, and in addition, he was certainly influenced by Terence Fisher's 1959 uh, film *The Mummy* for Hammer Horror, um, and to a, a far more, perhaps far more obscure film, *The Revenge of the Mummy* from 1975, a Spanish production featuring Paul Nashi, who was a prolific um, horror and B film actor who went on to star in Cardoso's *Werewolf in the Amazon* um, from 2005. So Cardoso was also a big fan of uh, directors like Hitchcock and Val Luton, among many others, um, Hollywood B directors in general as well, and he lovingly and openly flags his connections to their work in his film. And in fact, if you look very carefully uh, in one of the opening scenes of uh, The Secret of the Mummy, you'll see a very short snippet of uh, Hitchcock's film Suspicion, uh, starring Cary Grant and Joan Fontaine, which is being played on a television. I won't spoil too many of the other surprises about the film, but I just thought to, to bring that up um, because it's one of the interesting aspects of uh, what Cardoso does with these old films and uh, that he's very affectionate towards. Closer to home, Cardoso was obviously influenced by the first established director of horror cinema in Brazil, uh, José Mujica Marins. So Mojica created the nefarious uh, Zé do Cachau, or Coffin Joe, um, character played by the director himself, an undertaker who is hell-bent on continuing his bloodline and emerges in various films over uh, Mojica's career. Mojica directed a number of films, in fact, uh, featuring the character, um, but they also spawned a series of comic books as well as television and radio spots, um, so he's truly a, a multimedia kind of character. The first Coffin Joe film, uh, At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, was released in 1964, um, the same year in which Brazil's democratically elected president was deposed in a military coup. Um, and some scholars have seen in the sadistic violence of Mojica's films uh, an allegory or a building allegory of the kind of torture that dissenting voices face, especially towards the end of that decade. And indeed, uh, Mojica himself would face censorship after 1968 with his uh, 1970 film Awakening of the Beast, um, uh, never allowed to show in cinemas, essentially, uh, under the dictatorship. Mojica offered a protagonist for his films who, in his brutality and lack of pity, was completely unsympathetic, but at the same time uh, positively alluring, especially as a, this iconic inaugural horror figure for Brazilian cinema. Um, Cardoso took quite a different path, but he became friends with Mojica and was quite obviously influenced by him. And in The Secret of the Mummy, you'll actually see Mojica starring in one of the early, uh, early scenes of the film. Between, uh, so I'll just tell you a bit about uh, Cardoso's career now. Um, between 1970 and 1975, uh, he directed um, around 40 Super 8 films. Um, these films comprised of medium and short, uh, medium length and short films, as well as trailers, documentaries, um, clips, um, including music clips and other fragmentary pieces. Um, they often combine shocking and comical elements, as well as combining black and white and color, color film stock. Uh, 
and they were known collectively as the Quotidianus Codex. Um, and you can see in the top there um, that, that title, Quotidianus Codex, um, which was a name that he took from the chronicles of a Bayan writer, uh, Pedro Kilkeri, who earlier in the 20th century had uh, used that name for a series of um, series of observations of daily life that he conducted, um, which combined the sense of a journalistic piece, the, the quotidian, um, with the codex, the, so as, as a snapshot of daily life. So from the very beginning of his career, um, Cardoso was already making a concerted effort to devise his own brand and, and had this kind of idea of self-fashioning as a director who was of limited means and limited resources, but uh, also wanted to be well known and um, was able to quite successfully achieve that. So the the uh, Quotidianus Codex brand, if you will, um, was his original um, invention. And on the right, uh, the Super 8 logo was devised by Oscar Hamos, um, his visual designer that he worked with. And these um, kinds of icons appear um, in a lot of, well, in all of uh, Cardoso's Super 8 films and then on into some of his feature length uh, works later on. Watching his films, you'll also note um, various scratches on the celluloid um, that are put there by Cardoso himself and inspired by Majika Marins, who would do the same thing, um, as well as uh, Countdown on the Leader, which you'll see at the beginning of some of the films, as well as Sprocket Holes, and even an image of the famous China Girl um, before the film begins. So he has, even in, within his genre filmmaking, these kind of avant-garde gest gestures that um, mark his work as, as kind of lo-fi, but also um, consistently stamp his authorship over what he's doing um, all throughout his career. In his Super 8 phase, Cardoso f most famously made uh, the film Nosferatu no Brasil, uh, Nosferatu in Brazil, um, in 1971, uh, which was a medium-length film starring the tropicalist poet and columna columnist uh, Toquato Neto. Um, dealing very very early on with one of the staples of the horror genre. So Cardoso was um, obviously interested in horror from, from early days, um, but putting a deliberately Brazilian spin on F.W. Murnau's 1922 classic film. So Neto played a hippie vampire who preys on young women, um, at first biting and later learning to seduce them um, more successfully as he traverses the beaches of Rio de Janeiro. At one point in the film, um, so this is a this is kind of an instance of this combination of genre and horror. Um, Cardoso appropriates a line from a poem by Alfonso Avila as a kind of trick that was intended to modify his images in the mind of the viewer in a way that Super 8 film uh, was incapable of achieving. So Av Avila, who once wrote a line that read "Onde se ve isto, veja se aquilo," where you see this, see that, um, Cardoso appropriated for his own film "Onde se ve dia." where you see day, see night. So this comes at a certain point in the film uh, where, of course, Cardoso filming on Super 8 uh, with no lighting rig to support him cannot film at night. Uh, he merely substitutes in these uh, this, this line of concrete poetry or this line of poetry uh, to, to do the work for him. Um, so Murnau's original film, if you've seen it, uh, famously used coloured filters to dif differentiate between day and, day and night. So Cardoso was also kind of gesturing back towards um, the history of horror filmmaking, but also thinking about the transformative capacity of words um, to change images in the mind of the viewer in a way that actually film couldn't do for, for Cardoso at that point. And it was a kind of playful strategy that he'd repeat um, throughout his career, and I'll make mention of it again later. So it particularly derives as well from Brazilian concrete poetry, a movement that uh, emerged in the 1950s um, and which sought to bring the written word into the realm of the visual by em emphasising the pictorial, pictorial qualities of typographical arrangements, um, often using different permutations of the same repeated word to make a visual gesture. So a key example of, uh, of concrete poetry is uh, the poem Lucho Lixo by Augusto de Campos. Uh, which coordinates repetitions of the Portuguese word for luxury, luxo, um, in such a way that it forms as a whole the word for garbage, lixo, its opposite. Um, Cardoso, who was friends with Augusto de Campos and his brother Haroldo, as well as another poet, Decio Pinatari, and he would work with them on a number of occasions, um, draws upon the desire of the word in concrete poetry to become an image. Um, and here in Nosferatu no Brazil, in deliberately suggesting that day is night um, via words, and also suggesting in another slide that um, 1970s Rio de Janeiro is in fact 19th century Budapest, 
Um, Cardoso intentionally makes a virtue of the fact um, that he's of limited resources and makes a virtue of his um, limited financial means as well, um, precisely by gesturing towards this uh, avant-garde movement. A year after Nosferatu no Brasil, uh, while still working in Super 8, um, Cardoso would also make the first of his three mummy films, The Mummy Attacks Again. The film was first motivated by what Cardoso saw as a sarcastic suggestion by his friend, um, Eduardo Viveros de Castro. Um, Viveros de Castro, uh, who you'll hear uh, more about, um, certainly in this series, but uh, you'll also have the opportunity to to engage with an exhibition of his work, his photographic work soon, and and indeed hear from him in two weeks' time, Um, was at that time uh, a 21-year-old anthropology student studying at the National Museum in Rio. Um, and he came to Cardoso one day and said, quote, I think you should make a mummy film. The character will be yours alone. No one wants to make a mummy film in Brazil. Um, so perhaps on a very basic level here, without wanting to speculate too much, um, the particular suggestion of the figure of the mummy for Viveros de Castro calls to mind certainly some of the anthropological aspects of mummy films, um, which deal with the colonial presence of British and American uh, explorers and grave robbers in Egypt, uh, the migrations of Egyptian characters to Western countries, um, the clash of different regimes of knowledge, um, and the efforts of colonial forces to interpret, to quantify, and to catalogue that which does not belong to them. But here, um, the mummy appropriated to the Brazilian context would mean something quite different, um, and Cardoso, I don't think, was considering its anthropological dimensions much in the way that he used it. Um, he more saw it as a, as a kind of opportunistic way that he could put his stamp on horror cinema in Brazil. The entire complete film, uh, or incomplete film, I should say, was uh, 25 minutes long, um, but only snippets of that film are available because it, it was not uh, completed as he, as Cardoso would have preferred. Um, and like Nosferatu in Brazil before, it consists of a series of uh, mostly improvised uh, improvised performances. Um, there's no script for this film, as for most of uh, Cardoso's Super 8 films, there's no script. Um, there were a series of characters or scenarios that, that, that would be performed, but there's no script as such. Um, but it's very, a very kind of episodic film. Um, but there's one interesting innovation as, um, aside from this that we'll see in the following clip. And Pamela, if you could please play the first clip. Um, I, I should say that um, a lot of these Super 8 films were restored in 2005 and uh, were compiled as a as a um, as a series or as a, as as one single film. I think it was a Marca do Terir. So it's possible to to see some of these, but. Um, some of the clips, or well, the next clip rather, that or the final clip that I'm going to show is um, from a series of outtakes. So there are some, so there are some parts of Cardoso's work. He was very prolific that um, he hasn't kind of recuperated into anything more complete. So I'll be able to share something like that um, soon. But as you might have seen um, from that clip, um, Cardoso was um, picking up some of the traces of the various precursors to the mummy films in quite obvious ways in terms of uh, narrative and stylistic gestures, um, repeating set pieces that might be familiar from horror films, uh, the staging um, particularly, and, and, and the music which was added later, of course. Um, but as you can see here from the beginning, uh, his work paid homage to uh, those uh, RKO uh, mummy films of the 1940s starring Lon Chaney in a very obvious way. So he incorporated actually some footage from uh, The Mummy's Tomb and The Mummy's Ghost, these um, kind of 60-minute um, farcical horror films um, from the 40s um, right into his into his work. And he does this a number of times in some of his other films um, in, a very, in a very intentional way. But beyond those uh, short found footage elements that he incorporated, um, The Mummy Attacks, again, was shot both in a large house and in a favela in uh, Laranjeras, uh, uh, an area of Rio de Janeiro. Um, but apparently uh, shooting in the favela caused problems in production. Um, Cardoso recounts that the various scenes uh, shot in the favela involved nudity and lesbianism, um, causing a commotion as the inhabitants of the favela uh, hung onto the walls of their houses and it prevented the film from being shot um, and filming could not continue. So this was one of the reasons why he was unable to, to, to make the film. 
Um, according to the director, there were other various strange events, um, including Torquato Neto's, um, and you can see him there on the left, uh, Torquato, his, um, his reticence to be involved in the film and to play the role of a priest. Uh, Cardoso later found out that before the one day of filming that took place um, for this shoot, uh, Torquato had tried to commit suicide, and indeed in that year, um, one day after his 28th birthday, he would kill himself. Filming was uh, also hampered by the high cost of bandages for the mummy and other contingencies of the production process that were unforeseen. Um, some of the shoot took place at the Casa das Ruinas, and we'll see some of that shortly. Um, today, a cultural center at the top of Santa Teresa in Rio, um, but then actually a building in ruins and, and not a tourist attraction. Um, but the light fell too quickly when they were shooting. This was all in one day, remember? And the images from that location did not develop as, as planned. An attempt to film on the railroad that leads up to the statue of Cristo Redentor, the, the famous statue in Rio, was also thwarted by police who threatened to arrest Cardoso and his crew, um, but had sympathy for them when they discovered that they were making a Super 8 film about a mummy. Um, the tunnel of that railroad was later used in The Secret of the Mummy, and, and you'll see that later in the film. Even though, um, as a Super 8 film, The Mummy Attacks, again, seems quite uh, inconsequential in some respects, perhaps, um, and could only ever amount to a very modest um, production in terms of its budget and distribution, it was from the beginning actually designed as part of a larger transnational project. So the conceptual artist and Cardoso's friend, Elioi Jessica, who was based in New York at the time, uh, was making his own Super 8 film in 1972, Agrippina Roma Manhattan, which was intended as a complement to Cardoso's mummy film. Um, and the two were to be integrated into a larger project titled Las Mumias Kelia Manjaram, um, which, as uh, the Oitisika scholar Anna Catherine Broadbeck has pointed out, is a kind of nonsensical combination of Spanish and Portuguese that evokes uh, mummies being mummies taking control of human bodies. Um, Oitisika's film has nothing at all to do with mummies or indeed uh, to do with any kind of horror tropes, so it's unclear um, just how the two would fit together um, were they ever to have taken place. So Oitisika's film was shot on Wall Street um, and drew comparisons, or he tried to draw comparisons between ancient Rome and modern New York, modern day Manhattan. Um, the film features the drag performer Mario Montez, um, who can be seen rolling dice with Antonio Diaz, um, the famous Brazilian artist in um, in the in the street in um, in Wall Street, um, as well as a soundtrack featuring, um, not coincidentally, the Rolling Stones song "Tumbling Dice." At the time, uh, Oitisika wrote in his notes of Cardoso's importance for cinema. As Oitisika put it, um, Cardoso in his Super 8 phase um, owed nothing to the Brazilian, quote, clan cinema, um, that is the filmmakers associated with Cinema Novo um, and their bid for um, a kind of authenticity of social realism. And Cardoso's film Nosferatu, uh, Oitisika saw it as a kind of vampire bite directed at the jugular of these authors, uh, of, these, uh, of these directors. Unfortunately, as Oitisika seemed to realize, the power of a Super 8 film like Nosferatu no Brasil was completely lost on uh, these more humorless um, members of the old guard. Um, but luckily, he wrote, um, the mummy attacks again would constitute another attempt to jolt traditional film language, language out of itself. So in a quite obvious way, especially at this um, stage of his career, I think, um, Cardoso was a very reactionary filmmaker who wanted to create um, the opposite of what he saw as quite traditional um, bourgeois modes of filmmaking. Um, even if the content of Cinema Novo films was very um, politically, um, politically motivated and quite radical in some senses, there was still plenty of room to move for Cardoso in terms of cinematic language, um, to break free of old models, and um, that was what Cardoso was essentially setting out to do. He would work in Super 8 for a few more years until um, roughly 1975-76, but as the so-called um, Super 8 surge began to wane in Brazil, there were various um, Super 8 directors working all across the country, um, but because of limited dis distribution, they were often working in regional contexts in isolation, um, all the way up in Pernambuco, where there was also a scene, but in Rio and Sao Paulo, where there were where there were big cinema, uh, Super 8 scenes rather. But uh, at this time, as it began to wane, uh, Cardoso's attentions turned elsewhere. Following an extended trip to Europe and the US in the mid-70s, he began working with a 16mm Berlioz camera he'd bought in France. 
And it was then um, in 1977 uh, that Cardoso saw the possibilities for be- beginning his ill-fated mummy film again, uh, for which now uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro was again instrumental and actually wrote him a screenplay. Um, I haven't been able to read this because the only place it's published is uh, the, the book is now out of print, um, is available for um, a lot of money online, but um, the, the script isn't available uh, outside of that book. But I would, I would love to read it if I, if I had the chance. So this film uh, was inspired by a comic book um, that Cardoso found and which I haven't been able to track down either. Um, but it also drew on the early inspirations of The Mummy Attacks Again, um, but now with the added possibilities of a script by Viveros de Castro, which was a relatively new um, venture for Cardoso. Even with the script, however, Cardoso already had many of the scenes mapped out in his mind. As he writes of these impulses at the time, quote, I am hypnotized by certain cliches of genre cinema. Even when I shoot with the script, I create scenes and situations just to recreate these images. The genre film has its own grammar developed by Hollywood. You need to follow it to the letter to properly develop each sequence. So while finally beginning to make uh, his mummy film that was not completed in 1972, Cardoso was also throwing back to, um, to films from Hollywood history. Indeed, uh, one of the films that he mentions in this context was Sam Fuller's um, Shock Corridor. This is Cardoso here with Sam Fuller in Barcelona in 1984 when The Secret of the Mummy premiered there. Um, And Cardoso, having seen Shock Corridor, noted that um, one of the films, uh, one of the sequences in the film, one of the few colour sequences, which only lasts for all of about five seconds, was filmed at the Iguazu Falls in um, Brazil. Um, And Cardoso then intended to go to the Iguazu Falls and to film his own Iguazu Falls sequence for his mummy film. Um, so this is the kind of um, obvious, like, verbatim imitation almost that, 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 he, would, that he was after. Um, when The Secret of the Mummy was finally released, Sam Fuller was famously reported to have said, A mummy in Brazil, this is cinema. Um, <laughs> where I, I don't know if it's true or not, but... Um, but actually, uh, the trip to Iguazu Falls was fateful for the film um, because the lens of the camera broke on the way there and they were unable to replace it because it had come from France. So they again stopped filming um, this attempt to imitate um, uh, Fuller's film. Um, at this point, I'll just show a short clip, um, the second clip, which is from um, a selection of outtakes about 60 minutes from The Cursed Lake, um, the second go at the mummy film, um, which... For some reason, um, the sound hasn't been transferred, but you can enjoy it anyway. Um, But it's just about a minute, uh, and and you might be able to see something of a change here from the earlier Super 8 film. So, Pamela, if you could... Thanks. Um, Again, so so some of this footage, and and, um, there are plenty more scenes that Cardoso shot, um, was filmed with this camera with a damaged lens. So a lot of that uh, footage is actually out of focus and couldn't be used. Um, although it's quite interesting just to, just to see how he's progressing with the costume, which he was still complaining about at this time, um, the, the difficulty of affording bandages for some reason. Um, um, but he, he did engage uh, a few actors at this point and, and actually using that script um, began to work it up into a, into a kind of narrative feature or at least gesture towards a narrative feature at this time and those actors, some of whom would stay on for, for the feature film um, two years later. Um, so Cardoso uh, continued to make other 16mm films during this time um, but also made various short films he made a couple of making of documentaries for the directors Giulio Bressani and Rogerio Rogerio Scanzella Um, so he was employed in different capacities he was also a photographer um, during during these years Um, but in the late 70s in 1979 uh, Cardoso managed to find some funding to make a short film about Elio Itasica in 1979, in fact. So the friendship be- between Cardoso and Itasica um, began in the late 60s, um, a time when Cardoso cultivated friendships with a few different artists from Rio de Janeiro, uh, including Antonio Diaz, uh, Rubens Gertschmann, uh, who was famous, most famous for perhaps creating the cover art, um, cover design for the Tropicalia LP in 1968, um, but was also a plastic artist, um, made short films, um, and uh, ran a kind of artist's salon or studio in um, the Bowery while he was in New York in exile in the early 70s. Uh, 
Um, and uh, Cardoso was friends with Seeker himself at this time. But these these kind of artists all went into exile um, after the uh, institu- uh, the establishment or the decree of Institutional Act Number no. Five in 1968, uh, which increased the repressive nature of the dictatorship in Brazil. Um, so Oitasica, uh and uh, Gertzman went to London to New York, um, but Cardoso stayed behind in Brazil, um, so wasn't able to work with these artists anymore. Although he would try to work with Oitasica, as I mentioned, at a distance um, in 1972, that didn't quite eventuate. But when Oitasica, and this is Oitasica in London. Um, in 1969 at the Whitechapel exhibition that he held there. And um, again in New York on the subway um, with one of his parangoles, um, a cape that he designed. Um, when Oetisica returned to Brazil um, towards the end of the 70s, there were other op- opportunities for him to be involved in cinema, um, both as a plastic artist and in a new role that he requested of Cardoso, especially as an actor. Um, so for Julio Bressane's film, uh, O Gigante de America from 1978, Oitisica contributed what would be one of his final installation pieces, um, Tenda, da Luz, Tenda Luz, rather, Tent Light, um, which consisted of a wooden frame and translucent white fabric in the shape of a tent, um, which was constructed for the film in the sand dunes um, of a beach just up the coast from Rio de Janeiro. Um, and it's in its very brief appearance in the film um, is actually burned to the ground. So this was this um, short-lived installation that, that Oitasica constructed and um, which is in fact now being contested um, between Oitasica's estate and Brissane um, over the rights to who owns that installation. Uh, and in the following year, um, so uh, Oitasica offered something similar for Cardoso's film H.O. Helio Oitasica, which was... Um, Cardoso intended a film to uh, to capture something of the spirit of the artist's work, um, both as an installation artist and a plastic artist and an artist who created wearables, these capes. Um, but the film was not a straight documentary. It was trying to work these um, aspects of Oitasica's career in an avant-garde register. While, the direct, while Cardoso was um, unable to film many of Oitasica's works, which were at that time in storage, um, Oitasica did create a number of um, wearable artworks for the film um, specifically, um, but also, and you can see here, the parangoles, the capes, which are um, designed for wear, but which, were, which are quite um, difficult and unwieldy and designed to kind of create a sense of um, movement, a perpetual movement that um, causes colours to move around based on the way that the body's moving. So this was um, crucial to, to Oitasika's work and to his um, aesthetic philosophy as an artist. Um, but he did create, Oitasika, uh, one last installation. This was the final installation he made for Cardoso, uh, Rijan Vieira, um, a play on the name Rio de Janeiro, uh, which was an installation which features in um, the film H.O. That film also included the involvement of Caetano Veloso um, and other figures from Oitasica's um, artistic uh, circles, uh, Ligia Clark, Ferreira Goulart, and has a voiceover from the artist and a concrete poem uh, read out uh, by Decio Pinatari, but um, written by Aroldo de Campos. Um, so there's various avant-garde elements to to this um, film in, in order to seek his career. And I wanted to, to, to show this and to talk about this specifically because this was made in 1979, the same year that he was shooting um, The Secret of the Mummy, um, which wasn't released until three years later, but which was being shot basically around the same time. Um, so he also includes um, concrete poetry in the same way that he did in Nosferatu in Brazil to make these gestures um, from words to a kind of visual... Um, to, to a kind of visual that couldn't be accomplished in the film. This was again shot in Rio de Janeiro. Um, but in this case, um, the words were doing some of the work that they were all already doing in Cardoso's Super 8 film. So, so this is what I wanted to say as well, that Cardoso is at this time linking back to his um, earlier days as a Super 8 filmmaker and still thinking about that 
uh, mode of filmmaking and the contingencies around that, um, both in terms of production and distribution, even if he now has access to funding um, for his short films and even if he has access to a 16 millimeter camera and there's a bit of uh, a bit more kind of um, leeway and he's, he's a bit more liberated in the way that he can make films, he's still thinking back to earlier gestures that he'd made um, as a Super 8 filmmaker. But perhaps the most obviously interesting aspect of H.O. for our purposes this evening comes towards the end of the, f- end of the film um, in a sequence that Caruso shot a long take of Seeker walking through a shopping centre in Leblon, a beachside suburb of Rio, um, while the soundtrack from 2001, A Space Odyssey, plays over the top. So I'll just, um, we'll just show this clip now and then uh, we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so... As I just said, I mean, it's worth recalling that um, Cardoso was shooting this film in the sa- at, the, at the same time, or at least thinking about it at the same time as he was about The Secret of the Mummy. Um, because what we're seeing here um, is Elio de Sica um, lumbering about in a plastic sheet um, coupled by the rising intensity of the soundtrack, um, which, you know, really seems like nothing but the stuff of, of horror films. Um, so it's no mistake, I think, that Oitasika is already thinking in this way, and Cardoso too um, is directing his his artists to perform like this. So there are while there are also shots um, throughout the film of participants wearing um, Oitasika's wearable artworks, his parangoles, um, in a more joyous manner. Um, the resemblance of the artist himself to the mummy, I think, is no coincidence. The connection um, is also suggested by the final image that you would have seen there of bandages being wrapped across a red painted face, um, as well as shots. Um, uh, there's Oitasika and uh, Cardoso filming Oitasika. As uh, as well as shots like this one, um, and that recur recur a number of times throughout the film, um, in which coloured filters and meshes um, were passed across the camera in front of Oitasika's face. Um, I'll. I won't show the, the the shot from the Secret of the Mummy, but in, there there are various shots, or at least uh, at least one shot certainly, um, in which the point of view of the mummy is shown with this kind of um, with this kind of framing as well, with this kind of mesh uh, mesh work happening. So it's interesting to consider um, Oitasika's input into the costuming aspect of the film too. Perhaps the similarities here between Oitasika's nightmarish appearance and Cardoso's feature film were intentional. Um, Oitasika himself would go on to feature in The Secret of the Mummy um, and you may be able to spot him in his cameo of all of uh, four seconds as one of the associates of the high priest Karas um, seductively eating an apple um, in a tent in the first flashback to ancient Egypt. Um, so on the one hand, um, there's this really fascinating and unexpected history, I think, um, that even even Cardoso shares with Oitasika's artistic practice um, but aside from this avant-garde heritage, Cardoso's work has an elective affinity, affinity with pulp novels and comic books, an affinity that was cemented in the lead-up to The Secret of the Mummy uh, when Cardoso first encountered uh, Rubens Francisco Lucchetti. So Lucchetti, as uh, seen here, is an incredibly prolific author of pulp novels, comic books and screenplays, as well as uh, the co-director of a few hand-painted animations um, from the early 60s inspired by the abstract work of Norman McLaren. But he's best known as an author, the so-called um, Pope of the Pulps, who at last count had written over 3,000 comic books, as well as short stories and pocket books, uh, mostly in the genres of horror, crime and fantasy. And he continues to work today um, at a typewriter in his home in Sao Paulo State at the age of 87. Although many horror and crime comics in Brazil were tied to already existing titles from the US, um, there was still room for original content, and uh, this is where an author like Lucchetti um, stepped in. Especially when uh, US comic series were discontinued, um, Brazilian authors and artists o- often were able to take on or uh, reappropriate uh, certain, certain titles and certain series and characters for uh, a Brazilian audience. Uh, Lucchetti uh, especially worked in this kind of um, landscape where uh, Brazilian artists and writers were called on and he introduced various social concerns to his work um, that were particular to the Brazilian context, drawing on poverty and inequality and also thinking about the impending military coup in the 1960s when he was writing. It was in the 60s also that Lucchetti would begin working with José Mujica Marins, 
um, writing screenplays for his films, as well as comic book adaptations um, of the films that came that were released afterwards, and original comic stories based on the Coffin Joe character. But working uh, long after the golden age of comics in Brazil in the 50s and 60s, um, Lucchetti continued to work in the comics industry. Um, here seen with Ivan Cardoso. And began working on a series um, which was appropriated from Marvel Comics. Marvel Comics were at the time um, had their rights owned by the Brazilian publisher Editora Block. Um, and ran the supernatural thriller series, which included a storyline called The Living Mummy, um, which was released for a number of issues in the mid-70s in the US, but was discontinued, um, even though uh, it was continued in Brazil um, by the publisher. So Lucchetti and the artist Julio Shimamoto uh, completed six issues, um, Brazil Brazilian-only issues of the comic between 1977 and 1978, um, known as both um, A Mumia Viva, The Mummy Lives, um, and or The Living Mummy, and simply A Mumia, the, the Mummy. The first issue that uh, Lucchetti worked on for this series also featured a short photo essay arguing for The Mummy as a character who was more cinematic than Dracula um, and Frankenstein, who both had their origins in classic literature. Um, and actually it was quite typical of all of the, the, the comics that he worked on um, that there were these photo, novel, photo essays attached to them um, which related to, to cinema. Cardoso met uh, Lucchetti in the late 70s apparently without knowing about his work on the Living Mummy comic series but trading on his background as an author of pulp novels and comic books after their meeting Cardoso um, suggested the idea of, th of proposing The Secret Mummy as a serial um, which would have benefited from a number of having a number of short films as well as a feature and uh, Lucchetti began to write a script uh, based both on The Cursed Lake the previous Mummy film, and new material that he'd worked in from his comic books, um, which followed similar storylines in some respects to The Secret of the Mummy. Although there was already a good deal of material that had been shot and which was salvageable from the earlier shoot of The Cursed Lake in 77, Lucchetti, Lucchetti wrote a script that only incorporated about a quarter of that film, um, but which Cardoso nevertheless admired. And after he had done, um, as he had done for Mojica before, after The Secret of the Mummy was released, Lucchetti worked on a comic book adaptation of the film that was released afterwards. So I'll just say a very few brief words about the film, that, the feature presentation that we're going to see tonight before finishing. Um, not to give away too much, but just to give you more of the background to the film. Um, that Cardoso, uh, while he was a marginal film director and certainly involved um, with the cinema marginal movement, and talks about his filmmaking as um, part of the Udi Grudi um, scene, the underground scene. Um, for this film, he actually um, was able to find some funding from the government film body Embra Filmi um, to create the film. Uh, it wasn't too much funding and it ran out shortly, um, shortly after he used it, after three weeks of shooting essentially. Um, but this, this kind of um, strategy of, of, in, of using government funding for this marginal film pitches him in a, in a slightly different way to some of his predecessors, like Scanzella, whose film uh, um, The Red Light Bandit you'll see in a couple of weeks. Um, so shooting was completely undertaken in Rio, in the Baja de Tijuca, um, which is now a suburb, but um, which was formerly just essentially sand dunes and had some resemblance to Egypt. Um, Cardoso also incorporated uh, archival footage of the pyramids, which he used, and had some of the similar strategies that he'd um, called upon earlier in Nosferatu in Brazil to create a kind of otherworldly atmosphere, even as he was shooting in Rio. Um, as for the film itself, oh, and I forgot to say actually, the, the what, one other interesting aspect is that um, this scene on the right, which you'll see in the film, um, this map uh, on the bald head of Igor, who is um, the doctor's assistant, Professor Expeditus' assistant, was drawn by um, Eduardo Viveros de Castro. Um, so there's this really strange kind of um, backstory to to all of all of these small parts of the film that are otherwise unknown. So working with um, some of the actors that he'd previously hired um, for The Cursed Lake, um, Cardoso called again on Wilson Gray, who'd been um, an actor for Shenshadas and had been something of a ubiquitous presence in the musical comedies of the 50s and 60s, um, often conveying a kind of sinister or devious um, appearance. Um, 
He also worked with Giulio Medaglia, who was a famous composer and conductor who worked with Boulez and Stockhausen, um, and Felipe, Felipe Falcao, who was a lawyer and non-actor, um, whom Cardoso called the von Stroheim of Petropolis, um, after the city to the north of Rio de Janeiro. Um, as with Cardoso's earlier work, um, The Secret of the Mummy wears its debts to Hollywood on its sleeve. Um, Falcao's Igor, for instance, is modelled clearly on um, Fritz, the doctor's assistant from James Wells' Frankenstein, um, but is even more obviously based on Mel Brooks' Eagle from Young Frankenstein from 1974. Um, but there's a key difference in the Brazilian context, as you'll see, insofar as Igor is far more um, sexually active and has agency, um, which his predecessors may not have. Um, this was the era, of course, of the porno shanshada. So whereas the shanshada was a musical comedy genre of, of uh, the 30s through to the 60s, the porno shanshada was uh, a reinvention of that genre as a sex comedy in the 70s and 80s, which was very popular um, since the dictatorship allowed, essentially allowed for the films to be um, produced and to be screened since uh, sex was seen as uh, something more, more neutralized and less um, aggressive towards the dictatorship and not openly politically rebellious in any way. Um, so Cardoso was certainly opportunistic in working in that space and would go on to film um, part of a porno shanchada, and often his films incorporate elements of that genre um, into, into them. Uh, he also worked with uh, Clarice Piovesan, who, um, whose character is called Gilda, after um, the film by Charles Vidor from 1946. And... Uh, with Anselmo Vasconcelos, who uh, plays the mummy Runambi, uh, who is almost a carbon copy of Boris Karloff um, in many respects. So there are a variety of other film materials that we'll encounter um, as we watch the film, and there are many other connections to classical Hollywood, which I, which I won't mention. Um, but I will say that um, Cardoso, um, drawing again on his experience as a Super 8 director, um, and worked very hard to distribute and to exhibit the film, um, often accompanying the film to every single screening. Um, he took a mummy to the major openings of the film in many cities, including Rio, um, and yeah, called upon his, his strategies of, uh, of Super 8 exhibition in that way to, 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 um, to make the film a success. And it was indeed um, very successful, earning Cardoso and his cast and crew many prizes at various festivals in Brazil um, and allowing him to show the film at a number of European uh, genre and fantasy festivals in the early 80s, um, where it was also successful. Um, in fact, the national success of the film was such that at one point it was going to become a, a TV series on TV Globo, but that fell through. Um, and his Caetano Veloso with the mummy at the premiere in Rio. So with all of the different ingredients that went into the creation of this film and some of the ones that I've mapped and many that I haven't, um, there is a sense in which The Secret of the Mummy comes across as uh, a version of Frankenstein's monster. It's a hodgepodge of different characters and tropes from various American, British and even Brazilian films. But like Frankenstein's monster, it too wants to assert its singularity as a film. Um, it wants to say that even as a horror comedy, um, even in the most ridiculous of ways, that we can also try to take it seriously. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. This is a very, very interesting, and we're all very much looking forward to seeing the film, but we'll make a short break now, five or ten minutes, uh, just in case anybody still wants to go to the toilet or get something to drink, and then we'll proceed with uh, O Segredo da Mumia. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks again for, for your uh, wonderful introductory lecture. Um, it made us well prepared uh, for what we just saw. What we just saw could be described as a story of love lost and found and then lost again across millennia. Uh, you know, an immensely touching final moment with the red flowers on the lake. Um, you, uh, in, in your talk, you uh, mentioned the, the quote attributed to Sam Fuller, uh, which is probably apocryphal. But as it usually is with these kinds of quotes, they make a lot of sense. So uh, he, uh, 
may not have said it, but he certainly could have said it, and um, there is certainly a, a deeper meaning to what he said, namely the quote, uh, a mummy in Brazil, that is cinema. Um, as I was watching the film, I, I felt that what we're seeing is sort of a, somebody trying to get the, the essence, in a way, of particularly genre cinema and and commercial cinema and to the other art forms that you mentioned. Uh, pop music plays an important role. Uh, there's the Beatles song, um, uh, Pomp and Circumstance by Edward Elgar uh, is a reference. And uh, a lot of the, the shots have a distinctly comic panel feel to them. Um, the acting is sort of overly melodramatic. Uh, but clearly references the repertoire of emotional expressions that you can find in comic books as well, which is always like the basic emotions and big melodramatic gestures. Um, so there's a lot of truth to whether or not Fuller said it to the sentence, a mommy in Brazil, that is cinema. So I don't know if you wanna yeah. subscribe to that or sure <laughs> sure um i i mean i think that i think that you kind of hit the nail on the head there uh the fact i think that this because this is ivan cardoso's first film um he tried to pack everything into it mm. um and it felt like a long time coming for him and i think that the film is really kind of overdetermined in the fact that it tries to incorporate everything everything that he knew all of his influences um uh, from the filmmaking that he'd done himself from the uh, Super 8 and 16mm filmmaking, uh, from uh, Brazilian cinema, from the Shanshadas. So it's, if you watch any Shanshada films, musical comedies from Brazil, then there's a lot of uh, sympathy with what Ivan Cardoso was doing there. And he was throwing back to um, 40s cinema, both from Brazil and elsewhere, even back to silent cinema um, incorporated in there as well. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's completely... Um, exhausted um kind of suffused with everything that you can think of um and i think that i mean the the film the narrative suffers under the weight of all of that baggage um both both cinematic history but also the um the artistic legacies that he's dealing with his uh yeah the 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 things that i talked about before is his, his uh, negotiations of of avant-garde art like where to seeker is in this film so that means something to him um, and that's, that's what, that's what the end product is. That's the result of, um, trying to manage all of this, but trying to, at the same time, weave a coherent narrative based on all of these pre-existing stories that, that had come before him. But, um, I think there's a method to it somewhere right. in there. Mm. But just to my mind, there's never a dull moment in the film. I think the narrative moves along quite at a quite brisky pace, uh, it's a short 85 minute, uh, 85 minutes, but but it goes wrong uh, really quickly. One of the things that fascinated me was the insertion of found footage, uh, like that wonderful uh, newsreel segment about the beauty pageant, mm -hmm. uh, which he then sort of mimics in his own style yeah. and and uh, adds a, a different, um, uh, you know, his own his own little newsreel segment to it. It reminded me of a story that a uh, veteran Indian film producer once told me. Um, one of the two famous Vadia brothers, the Vadia brothers were Parsi filmmakers and pioneers of the Indian sound film industry, and um, they had devised a, a production strategy whereby one of them would sit in the cinema and have a connection to the projection booth uh, they could pull a little cord and then a bell would ring and the projectionist would insert a little paper slip in the print as it uh, rolled and uh, if you know the bell rang again there will be another slip and <clears throat> in between those two slips were the scenes that were then cut out of the print to be reused in a audio film uh, so that's they, they watched American films shown in Indian cinemas and you know there were all these big action scenes that they didn't have the money to produce so they simply cut them out of 
that's what he told me. Um, <laughs> another perhaps yeah. apocryphal story. But they cut them out of American distribution prints and inserted them in their own films. So they made an internegative and and uh, uh, used used the big action scenes, borrowing the production values of American films. And <clears throat> uh, I mean, one of the things that that we're trying to accomplish here is to make clear that there are many histories of cinema. Uh, that have not been properly told yet, and I think this is one of them. And <clears throat> the Vardial Brothers story uh, belongs to that, and and it, it you know, it I'm I'm bringing this up because it points to a similar production environment. Uh, this is someone who clearly doesn't have a lot of money, uh, but desperately wants to make a film, and works with it whatever he has, and in the end he has a film, and every single shot you know you sit there you see the references. But they work as film shots, and the scenes work as scenes, and the narrative, to my mind, works as a narrative. Uh, so, so it's really uh, from from scrap pieces and bits and pieces he manages to make cinema. So I don't know if you would would uh, agree with that kind of specific production logic that we're seeing at work here. Yeah, yeah, I think I mean he was doing that as I said as well from the early days from his Super 8 films when he inserted those scenes from the Lon Chaney Mummy films. He was already kind of thinking in that mode of found footage cinema we would call it nowadays. Um, but he's I mean he's using archival images for different purposes. I mean not to re not to create the illusion that we're actually in Egypt. I think it's quite obviously uh, you know, the still shots of Cairo and of the pyramids um, are intended as a as a kind of a, a comical gesture, um, but also but the but the footage of the beauty pageant is kind of intensely uh, an affectionate thing for him. It's a it's a throwback to a moment from 1954 when uh, Miss Brazil won the Miss uh, Miss Universe contest, right. and this is a big thing for him, and and he's very nostalgic for this this kind of past, which is only you know um, less than 30 years old. Um, so there are these elements of nostalgia in the in the way that he uses found footage. Um, I'm just thinking ahead. I mean, the next film that you'll be screening in the Tropical Underground series is The Red Light Bandit by Rogerio Scanzella. And Scanzella deals in a different way, not with not so much with found footage, but with uh, with with different elements and different materials. Um, and it seems to have some spirit or some of the same sentiment of uh, the montage, the way that it's arranged, and the way that um, there are, there are kind of is an episodic feel to it. Um, and there are different elements that are put that are juxtaposed alongside each other, and similar in a similar way to what Cardoso is doing. Um, but I think that. Um, he works. He w works even differently within that within that mode. He's mm. thinking. Um, he's, he's. All of these things have a purpose for him, and they're not just. Uh, it's not just by happenstance that something emerges from from like this Brazilian beauty pageant. That that he's very careful and calculated in what he's doing, even though it seems by chance that that because I mean that's how the editing works. That we see this film, and it's completely surprising. Most of the shots, half of the shots are are. Uh, whether they're in the main narrative or whether they're plucked from elsewhere from other films, um, I think we're often surprised by what comes up, mm -hmm. yeah. and so he's it's very effective in that sense. Um, yeah, it's 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 in a, in, in a way it's a bit like watching a Godard film. You know, mm -hmm. every shot is sort of a a new sensation or at least something that makes you wonder where that came from, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so so that makes it pleasurable to mm -hmm. watch, at least for me. And just lest we think that this is somehow some kind of third world copy-paste strategy, I just want to uh, reference a film by Howard Hawks, which uh, title will come back to me, but it's Howard Hawks' contribution to the 1950s monumental Egypt Land story, of the Pharaohs. Land, Land of the Pharaohs. Written by William Faulkner. The written by yeah. William Faulkner. And in that film, you know, the story of the building and the pyramids is told as a newsreel segment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, the, the you know, at dropping any pretense of the historical drama, it references a contemporary media journalism format uh, in order to, to recapitulate the, the architectural history of the pyramids. So Hollywood's doing the same thing mm -hmm. in a way. You know, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not like this is some kind of ripoff aesthetic strategy it goes both ways anyway um one thing i i want to bring up is uh the massive amount of female nudity in this film um we're in a exploitation cinema logic of course and he wants to be commercial and successful 
And one of the ways to do that in the 70s and 80s is to put a lot of naked skin on screen. Um, you know, I don't know. Can can you you you, met, you brought it up that <laughs> one of the things that that f f stopped the first attempt at making a film was that there was too much nudity in the favelas and and people would interrupt the filming because they didn't want to see naked women running around their houses too much. And so, can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean, you made an important comment saying that. Uh, <laughs> the military dictatorship actually sort of encouraged sex in the cinema because they thought it would distract from social criticism. Yeah, I mean, it was it was certainly let go a lot more. I'd kind of forgotten watching this film how incredibly sexually retrograde it is. Um, but it comes at this really interesting kind of hinge moment where this genre, the porno chanchada, is becoming a dominant in Brazil. Um, and has seemingly no redeeming features um so i think ivan cardoso is in this in this time at the at the cusp of the decade where he is both a figure of cinema marginal and he's inheriting a lot of his strategies from other cinema marginal directors who would more <laughs> obviously classify in that mode who are underground directors but he's also veering into this new decade he's a bit younger than some of his predecessors and he's seeing you know he's, he's opportunistic i think in the way that he works into a new mode which is absolutely um commercial so cinema marginal in a lot of ways had this um ongoing flirtation with um kitsch um and with hollywood right. and with um and with sex as well but not in the overt way that's available to cardoso in 1979 1982 um and it's and it's quite interesting i mean to, to think about how he works. I mean, and it just gets more vulgar, more overt, overt um, t as you go along in his filmography. Um, I mean, the, there's interesting ways to think about that. There's a fascinating film um, that just came out this year. It's a found footage film called Historias que nosso cinema não contava, um, Stories that our cinema didn't tell. It's just a montage film made up of scenes from porno chanchadas. Mm but it mines those films for their political content. Mm -hmm. I mean, these films just seem completely um, just set their sex comedies and there's nothing redeeming about them. But this film actually restores or locates something of the political value in mm -hmm. their commentary on the dictatorship. Um, it's by mm -hmm. Fernando Pessoa. It's a, it's a really amazing film. But I, th I think that when you watch something like this, um, without the contextualization, it doesn't seem... Um, it doesn't seem very, uh, very interesting at all. I mean, I mean, and it's obviously uh, that that kind of availability of sex and of the of that new genre mm. um, diverts the narrative in very obvious ways. It creates moments for him where he thinks, you know, I'll just insert a scene here, which which will kind of you know appease viewers or mm. be more commercially appealing. So. Mm. Yeah, uh, which again makes you think of Godor and contempt, where mm. the famous bed laugh scene with Brigitte Bardot was inserted at the behest of the yes. producers and, and he just turned it into sort of an art piece. So let's open the discussion to the audience. Any questions from those who are still in here? Yes, please. Thanks for the lecture. My question would be, um, did Cardoso ever say that this was maybe something also like a self-portrait? I mean, Vitos is clearly uh, the crazy director, in a way, the crazy Cardozo. I mean, we talked we talked about found footage, you know, how you put the ghosts of the past, the histories of the past, the, how you patch them together, all the genre history and so on. So in a way, I think maybe one of the reasons why he was so keen to make this happen is that he can also tell in a funny way something about himself, about his obsessions, about about the past, about uh, film history and so on, and put it together. And uh, uh, you, you can see that also in Vitos, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I saw, when I saw the movie, I had very much that feeling. Yeah, yeah I, hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of that at all. Um, I know I've read, a, I've read a review of the film that says, that quotes one of the, the, the Vitos' lines, bit, you know, about experimentation, and you always have to experiment. And this is what Cardoso was doing as well, and the reviewer pointed out this, this kind of similarity. Um, and he chose Wilson Gray as the actor for Vitus because he came from the Shanshada era, um, and Cardoso wants to pitch himself in that in that kind of mode as well. Um, but I hadn't thought of that as as Vitus as this character who is clearly 
kind of pulling the strings and arranging the characters in different ways so as to, so as to create a film. Um, and actually, you know, those inserts with – or those those sections which are news reported, reported sections um, – reporting on the minister's visit and everything. I mean, he's um, this centre of... He has the centre of attention and that's what Cardozo is projecting for himself too, um, in a sense, and what he achieved at film festivals. I mean, reading his biography, he's very um, quick to talk about all of his success successes with this film at festivals and um, how... So someone like Sam Fuller, um, you know, had said, you know, sung his praises in, in a very big way. Um, so I think that that, that kind of... Um, inflated sense of self that we see when Vitus is not far from the director himself. The misunderstood genius. Well. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions or remarks? I mean, one of the... Uh, picking up the thread that, that uh, we just treat it uh, about nudity and exploitation in the sex comedy film. One of the histories that uh, of cinema that also remains to be written is the uh, the history of 1970s and 80s global popular cinema beyond Hollywood uh, because you know similar phenomena appear in European uh, popular cinema uh, some work has been done, but there could be more on Nazi themes, exploitation films from the 1970s. Uh, I mean, uh, Tarantino, of course, references this kind of work, kind of stuff in in uh, Inglorious Bastards. But uh, what happens in European cinema goes way beyond that. So there's always it's always on the boundary of soft porn, and and a lot of it has to do with uh, trying to counter the dominance of Hollywood with stuff that you can do but that Hollywood can't do. Uh, Hollywood has always been, since the 1930s, uh, been very keen on regulating market access by suppressing sexual content. And, uh, you know, if you look at the history of the production code, one of the, one of the reasons why the industry eventually embraced the production code quite enthusiastically was that it gave them, and it gave the big studios an instrument to exclude um, non-studio competitors from from the market, namely precisely producers that would highlight sex and nudity and violence um, in ways that the production code called you know called into question, and and so there's a global competition here, and um, um, you know European films and Brazilian films certainly did things that Hollywood or offered things that Hollywood didn't offer and sort of try to to put it in old Ricardian terms, uh, generate the comparative advantage through nudity, uh, if you will. And so that, that, I think, is another history that would need to be written. And, and that film, if you look at it uh, as a film of the 70s and 80s, uh, certainly inserts itself into that history, I would say. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, um, actually for the trailer that Cardoso um, directed or edited essentially for this film, um, he made a point of including the line that this film would show you the Egypt that Hollywood would never show you. Exactly. Um, yeah. So he, ma he makes a point of, of, of drawing that um, distinction. I took, um, a, I took a picture of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not an Egypt I know. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... Yeah, so I mean, as much as he has this affection for old Hollywood, for classical Hollywood, he's he's making he is making a distinction from it, I guess, in mm. in a different way. I mean, he would love to enjoy the success of a ho mm. popular Hollywood film, but um, nevertheless, he needs to carve out a niche for himself in a market that's flooded with Hollywood films already. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to it's it's hard to say um, exactly. Exactly how he fits into that, um, into that mode. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'd be interested to know exactly how popular this film was. I haven't done that research I, because I suspect it wasn't as popular as he makes it out to be. Mm. Uh, and compared with other films of the porno chanchada genre, for instance, or other popular cinemas, uh, comedies from the same time, I suspect. Or, or some of the Zinma Marginal films that were definitely huge hits in the cinema. Sure, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd just be interested to know, actually, in terms of um, 
in terms of how well I mean it was successful at at genre festivals as I said but I don't know in terms of um, its popularity in Brazil really I mean in terms of figures um, so I'd, I'd I'd be curious to know about that um, but I mean the, the, that uh, you know the, the the Egypt Hollywood never showed you that's also reminiscent of what Todd Haynes does to Douglas Sirk in in Far From Heaven you know let's let's inject some race and queerness uh, into a classical Hollywood melodrama and sort of tease out the subtext that is already in there, but that you know Hollywood never dares to to bring out. Uh, so so you know Cardoso's position vis-a-vis Hollywood is probably also comparable to to that of of people like Todd Haynes who sort of you know offer a palimpsest of Hollywood by that reveals or ins- inscribes certain themes into. Uh, classical Hollywood narratives that that are suppressed in the original films. Yeah, I I mean, but I think that the the difference would be that Cardoso is not interested in any way in psychology or politics. Yeah. Um. There's no. There's there's not no, in an overt there, yeah, way. Yeah. So so there's no sense. I mean, his politics is a um, a politics of being able to um, uh, to rearrange and 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 edit images in any way he wants to include all sorts of material that. Is not fit for a normal narrative feature film, um, but it's not in any way to um, to subvert um, dominant conventions of any jo- of, mm. of the genre by by introducing any progressive political element. Obviously, um, so <laughs> I think that I mean he's he's yeah. all about surfaces, about gestures, about actions, um, and that really goes back to I mean the the film. Um, the film that inspired him the most was The Red Light Bandit, which is the next film in your series. And you'll see, if you watch that film, the, the similarities um, in terms of the, I mean, the structure of feeling around that film and the way it's put together. There's um, things like a radio voiceover is very prominent in The Red Light Bandit. And so Cardoso saw in that film a way to, um, to think about his own work. Um, Scanzello wrote a lot about... Um, he has an essay, the cinema do corpo, the cinema of the body, and he he values directors, Hollywood directors especially, who um, who are attached to surfaces, to gestures, to actions, to objects, rather than any kind of psycholo- psychological or um, or moral capacity of a story. So in in that way, um, Cardoso is subverting certain traditions of, of Hollywood cinema or, or even of European cinema mm-hmm. by refusing to engage. Well, yeah. yeah, particularly European cinema. I mean, that's oh. something that always bears repeating, that that uh, part of the energy of Cinema Marginal and of, of the Super 8 movement uh, derived itself from the rejection of Cinema Novo and its fixation with European modernism. Uh, and, you know... There is, of course, a certain critique of psychology in in... 1950s European novels and films, but it still heavily revolves around those concepts. And uh, I mean, what you just said about his politics, it's all about him being able to put images together in any way he wants. Uh, I'm sorry to, to be so repetitive about this, but that sort of reiterates the critique that, uh, you know, left wing filmmakers and critics. Uh, offered of Godard's political unreliability. You know, he's he's not really a progressive filmmaker. He's only just interested in putting images together in any way he wants. Uh, so there, there's another connection in that sense, probably. I mean, it's, it's it bears mentioning, mentioning that Godard actually comes from a solidly conservative, if not reactionary, background. Um, Maybe you want to comment on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Cardoso was a big fan of Godard, actually, and yeah. and yeah, he he makes a point of that when when he met him at Cannes, I think, in eighty three. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's so Cardoso's fil- filmmaking as part of Cinema Marginal, on the one hand, is a reaction against Cinema Novo, very overtly. Cinema Novo itself is a reaction against the Chanchadas, against the attempt of Brazilian. Uh, the Brazilian film industry to create a kind of studio system to polish their products in a way that resembled Hollywood feature films. Um, so there are these different kinds of reactions going on against the, the previous generation or the previous movement. But then, as I said, I mean, Cardoso is slipping into another thing altogether. He's not a marginal filmmaker in the way that Scanzella, Bressan, they were marginal filmmakers with no money, with 
um, with plots that were far less uh, attached to any kind of ex pre-existing narrative structure, um, and and also, I mean, there was a there's a big thing at the end of the seventies um, when Glaber Rocha, for his final film, The Age of the Earth, um, took money from Embra Filmi, the government body, to to fund this. I mean, it was a re very expensive film, but to fund his film, that was a highly controversial move because it's. Um, kind of paying lip service to the dictatorship by by taking money from from the government and Cardoso was doing similar kinds of things. It, this film was funded by Embra Filmi, and n marginal cinema generally was not. Um, so it, it's it's this, it's this kind of um, poverty of means on the one hand, um, and and projected as a, as a limit limitation of resources and and um, limitation of means. But on the other, there is finance behind this. Um, so it's a it's it's not a it's not a clear story there. Okay. Yes. Niels has a question. Oh, well, first let me thank you for the brilliant uh, talk you gave. And uh, one point you've mentioned uh, right or um, more at the beginning, uh, I found it very striking was the paralyzation of uh, Hitchcock and uh, Cardoso, so paralyzing himself to the master of sus suspense as the master of terror. Um, and you've also hinted us already upon the, the clip that was included in the found footage montage uh, from the Hitchcock piece. Could you expand a little bit on that? Sure. Um, I mean, did everyone spot that clip from Suspicion? I, I Probably if I hadn't mentioned it, I, I had to rewind and work out the, the film it was from based on, yeah, okay, it's Cary Grant. And it, but, but, but the glass of milk appears twice in the film, so yes, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. A, sort of a triple reference. Yes, so he, he's, he's very, yeah, so it's not just the found footage element there. But, um, and in his next feature, um, The Seven Vampires, which is not at all about vampires, the cl there's a club called The Seven Vampires, it's a completely misleading title, but... Uh, he features a clip of Hitch Hitchcock from um, from Alfred Hitchcock Presents, I believe. Uh, but he's introducing Cardoso's film. The, the Hitchcock is dubbed so as to introduce Cardoso. So there's a nice, and then he includes the the um, some of the music from Psycho in that film too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, and actually, I think Cardoso makes a cameo at the end of that as one of the photo photojournalists taking a photo of the mummy in the lake. So he does have, although he doesn't appear. I don't think in his other films he has this kind of uh, Hitchcockian kind of gesture towards, you know, the, the walk on role of the director. But I, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that. I mean, his films are obviously not constructed in in any of the way that a Hitchcock film is. He's he. There's no suspense. Um, there's no suspense here at all. There's just every scene is just it's so episodic that there's no um, coherency in a way that. Hitchcock would string us along at all, um, so there's. I mean, the. I mean, it's it's an affectionate kind of throwback to to Hitchcock, but I mean, there's not there's not too many connections other than maybe symbolic or or narrative connect small narrative connections, but not um, sustained. I mean, uh, just just uh, to point out this detail, Cardoso does Hitchcock one better in this film. Because as we all know, there is no poison in the milk glass in Suspicion, but there's poison in the milk glass here. So, <laughs> uh, so he really he really beats him at his own game. Um, and one of the other things, I mean, that would be interesting uh, to see what Hitchcock's reputation was in Brazil in the 60s and 70s. But one thing that we tend to forget since Hitchcock has been so canonized as one of the great artists of the 20th century in the last 30 to 40 years is that Hitchcock's reputation was pretty bad in the 60s and 70s, his critical reputation uh, without the French and that book that he paid for um, he would probably not have ascended to the heights of reputation that he has and if you read reviews of, of the time there's this wonderful book by Robert Capsis about the reputational history of, of Hitchcock, you find out that he was sort of the um, uh, what's the thriller writer American, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a total background. Uh, he's a fiction writer who writes all these suspense horror thrillers. All right? Stephen King. Yeah, Stephen King. So uh, St Stephen King. No, nobody, nobody will get a full professorship writing a book on Stephen King in an American English department. You know, 
Uh, and so Hitchcock at one point would have meant the death of your academic reputation if you wrote a book about it. Now you can make your academic reputation writing a book about him. So that's a, another interesting um, uh, oscillation, if you will. And uh, it will be interesting to see where what Hitchcock's status was in, at Brazil. The, in Brazil at the time that... that um, that Cardoso saw his films. I mean, uh, it's interesting th just thinking about that, thinking about Cardoso's academic reputation, how Cardoso is dealt with by scholars. Um, because, when, you know, when you when you come to a film like this, it doesn't seem like there's much to, um, to delve into. Um, the way that I presented it clearly has almost no connection with the film that you just saw. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, there are... But I'm not sure. <laughs> But there, so there are the there are all of these elements that I think are are fascinating to to discuss in in relation to Cardoso's career, which yeah, which which kind of dissolve or disappear from from the films in some ways, um, which are not self evident. Um, and I think that that some of the scholarship I've read does does tend to to look towards that and to to take seriously the way that he puts his films together to to his relationship with cinema marginal. Um, so I think. Maybe I mean he's still he's still making films, um, so there's still there's still work that's uh, responding to his current his current stuff. Um, his most recent film that came out this year is a short film called uh, Colirio de Corman. Uh, it features Roger Corman, um, the famous B movie producer director, um, dropping um, eye drops into Cardoso's eyes, um, and then Cardoso has this reaction. And he goes crazy, and he has this kind of—it's this hypnotic spiral that you would have seen in the film. And then he just uh, imagines all of these images from films that he's previously made, uh, while Roger Corman's standing over him with the <laughs> eyedropper. So, so he's he's continuing to, yeah, I mean, he's continuing to think back again to his older work, um, and also to older directors, producers like like Corman, people who who he admired from from B movies. So, I just—I I don't think you should. Um minimize your contribution here. I think what you're presenting has a lot to do with the film that we saw. Uh, and I, uh, if, I, if I may add that, I don't think the question of whether or not Cardoso be, can be canonized as an important filmmaker is really the most important question that oh, we can okay. ask about his work. Uh, it's really more a question of alternate film histories. And I think you, you gave us a very, very good point of entry oh, into thank you. one of those histories with your talk. So, do we have any more questions? If not, I suggest we call it a day. Thank you so much for coming and for uh, introducing us to the rich and wonderful and strange world of Ivan Cardoso in such a competent and multi-layered layered way. Uh, I think this was a very, a very helpful station on our path into uh, the the underworld of Cinema Marginal. Thank you so much for coming. Thank and you. Thank you all for coming and for joining the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Seven, for being with us today. I would just like to remind you then, um, as has already been mentioned, the next uh, lecture of Tropical Underground is on the 30th of November, here in the cinema at the same time. Um, and we're going to screen the Red Light Bandit um, with a um, wonderful um, guest. Um, if I also may uh, mention this, uh, just so that everyone remembers it, the screenwriter of the film that you just saw, Eduardo Rivera de Castro, and the, and the stills photographer of the film that you saw. By the way, our poster uh, and our flyer, of course, uh, uses a still from this film. Um, uh, uh, Eduardo Rivera de Castro will be in Frankfurt in two weeks, and he will give the Kantorovich lecture on no, uh, November 15th, Kantorovich lecture in political language. Uh, his title is uh, um, Let's Do Away with the Ontological Pri Privilege of Our Species. That's a paraphrase, but that's what the title is all about. Um, so that will be the Kantorovich lecture on November 15th, uh, 6 o'clock at the casino. 
and uh, there will be a panel discussion with Kurt Riechelmann and Oliver Precht, the German translator of Viveros de Castro's works, uh, about the concept of anthropophagism that we discussed uh, in our opening um, session in this lecture series. And then on November 17th, on Friday, there will be the grand opening of the uh, photo exhibit, um, Variations on the Wild Body, at the Weltkulturmuseum. And we will resume our fun and work here on November 30th. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And then the last uh, announcement um, for those who don't want to wait so long for the next Brazilian film here in the Film Museum. Tomorrow starts the uh, Latin, Latin American Film Festival, Dias de Cine, and tomorrow at 10 o'clock here uh, we'll be screening Aquarius from Clever Mendonça Filho. So if you don't have a ticket yet, you can still get one. Um, tomorrow so don't miss the festival goes until sunday so we're going to have also great um contemporary brazilian and latin american films so you're all invited uh, to that as well this weekend um thank you once again very much stefan thank you vincent and uh see you in the next screening thank you.